Good evening, everybody. This is the regular board monthly meeting of Downers Grove Great School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, December 9th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi is absent. Member Hannes? Here. Member Harris? Here. Member Olchik is here by phone? Here. <laughs> Member Samanti? Here. Member Weiner? Here. And Member Hughes? Here. I'm going to go ahead and start off uh, today's meeting with the flag salute with, uh, it says Highland, but with uh, Bel Air.
Thank you. And we'd like to welcome up uh, Brent Beauchard. Hi, good evening, everyone. Student Council, thank you so much. Um, great job. They are um, often busy getting things set as far as our school projects. They've had lots of initiatives this year. Um, they also highlighted some things from last year since we didn't have a board presentation with you last year. So very proud of them. Keep up the great work. Uh, tonight, I thank you for the opportunity to come and meet with you and share um, some updates on how we're doing towards the strategic plan and where we are with goals. So you'll see that I've planned just a, a very short presentation for you, and then I'll introduce one of our PTA uh, presidents tonight um, who will share some things going on as far as PTA. So that one was really focused on how we are connecting with the community. I wanted to give you just some brief glimpses of different ways that we are including our community. Um, and I've listed some different ways and different avenues that we've done so. Um, our PTA is extremely supportive, extremely active, and really great at bringing in a variety of events, as you can see, to get our community involved during the day, before school, even after school. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to highlight um, is this was the first year, thanks to PTA, that we've had a Veterans Day assembly. We figured if we're going to be in school for Veterans Day, why not take the time to really capture our students and bring them together to really recognize and honor uh, veterans and those currently serving and protecting us and our country. Um, absolute tremendous time for all of us, um, very meaningful, and the students' attention kindergarten through sixth grade was spot on uh, from start to end. One thing that we did just finish is uh, breakfast with books, a real nice opportunity to uh, bring families in in the morning, have just a, a light breakfast treat, and then head up to the classrooms to read with their students right before school started. We do make um, use of our Donners Grove Village as well to bring in some different avenues, some different types of education that um, isn't currently as a in part of our day. Um, but Egg in the Classroom has been great. Uh, the Junior Achievement is up and running as well. As far as the school, we do some of the same things that our other schools in the community or in District 58 are doing by bringing in some mystery readers for our students. Um, we have brought in authors. We do have Authors Fest coming up later this year. Um, as part of the science curriculum, um, sixth grade did do some dissection this year, and we brought in uh, two parents who actually are veterinarians to uh, support that. And then to support the communications goal that our district has and that the school has, I'm still publishing the weekly newsletters for parents that include just some updates and some scheduling items that will take care of the week, uh, some general knowledge about the school as a whole, some updates on curriculum here and there, and then some pictures also that parents can uh, see their students interacting and in curriculum throughout the day. Seesaw is up and running, has been at, at our school for quite some time, and the teachers are, are tremendous and, and updating and communicating with parents through that. Um, when I checked last week, there have been over 26,000 items posted and over 30,000 parent visits. I think those numbers are tremendous for any school, um, but for a school of our size, I'm very proud. And that's just a testament to the signs of the involved parents that we have and the supportive community um, that Bel Air is. When we're focusing on uh, learning that strategical 1.4, um, we're taking a look at our map data. Uh, I'm really anxious and curious to see how things look from winter of last year to winter this year. The benchmark is currently open and students are taking those assessments this week as well. The spring target for reading 
was that we were hoping our students in the building would be at 75% uh, and currently school-wide we're at 77%, so very proud of that number. Um, when we're looking at that same goal for math, uh, the strategic goal is looking at 71% or greater and Bel Air is at 72, a little bit closer to that. So what do we do from here? Yes, from our spring benchmark, we're above the goals that were set. Um, we're still monitoring our interventions. We're making sure that students are moving in and out of those appropriately. We're still having discussions as a faculty and, and staff of the importance of small group instruction, but also the difference between small group instruction and differentiated instruction to make sure students are getting what they need to move forward. Um, you'll remember from the school improvement plan for Bel Air, I'm closely monitoring how our accelerated math students are doing as well. Um, we are accelerating them with purpose. Um, we've really gotten better at identifying students who might be good candidates and benefit from that program. And I also want to make sure that our high students are meeting and exceeding their growth targets as well. When we're taking a look at our IAR, we're a little bit below target on that one. Uh, the district was um, setting the goal for 50% of our students meeting or exceeding the expectations of that IAR in both English language arts um, and in math. You can see that when we're taking a look at our ELA, we're at 49%, so we missed our, our target by 1%. Um, when we're taking a look at the um, target for math, we're, we're under by two points. So far this year, the district has provided um, some whole, whole group um, messaging and um, importance at one of our Monday in-services, which was absolutely great. It was a nice reminder for us to take a look back at uh, the pieces that we already have in place to help our teachers prepare students, gave some insights as the type of questions that we really should be asking, and the importance between um, focusing simply on our concrete questions going all the way up to the abstract. At the school level, uh, we've taken one faculty meeting so far to look specifically at Bel Air's data um, to see where we are by grade level. Um, from here, we're going to be taking a look at actual assessment um, topics, actual assessment questions, to make sure that we're not just preparing for the test, but that we're taking some of the questions, which are really great, very strong and very abstract within the IAR, and embedding those into the curriculum that the students interact with every day. That way we are ensuring that we are teaching students the way that they should be taught, um, and they are being asked questions that they're going to be asked once they get to that test um, this spring. So some plans in place. Moving forward, I think that we're going to have some better turnouts for um, our percentages of students meeting and exceeding. Of course, we're still making use of um, our reading specialist, our resource teacher, our social worker, instructional coach, um, to make sure that we are providing supports along the way. And that's what I have for our presentation today. Um, let me go ahead and introduce Erin um, Berger. She's our president for our PTA. Thank you for having us. Um, so as Brent has said, um, we are off and running with PTA. We kicked off the year with our um, fun run, which is our biggest fundraiser. We also celebrated the 50th anniversary at that time. We had a lot of great vendors. Um, we also had a, a special performance by the Jesse White Tumbling Team, which was a great ad. Um, they are awesome to watch, and the kids really loved it. We also, as you saw, the teachers volunteered to take a pie to the face, which is probably the biggest part of the fundraiser, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so thank you to our teachers and staff and Mr. Borschel for that. Um, we also put on our first Veterans Day assembly in a very long time. Um, we had a couple of PTA moms said, hey, we should do this. We're in school. Let's celebrate it. Let's recognize um, some local veterans. So that was great. The kids loved it. Staff loved it. Um, definitely looking forward to continuing that in the future. Um, kind of just for adults only, our second biggest fundraiser is our upcoming trivia night in February. Sticking with the 50th um, anniversary celebration theme, we're doing Peace, Love, and Trivia 1969 theme. So we'll be getting our bell bottoms out and all that good stuff. So that'll be coming up. And then for our kids, we have the variety show in March uh, at the Tivoli. So they definitely look forward to that and seeing all of our talent. And then all of this fundraising goes to support like our theater trips, uh, LRC nights, assemblies, the end of the year picnic, and any kind of teacher requests um, that comes our way. So we are a very small school, but we do what we can to kind of make sure we supplement all the great work that our teachers are already doing. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, so much for being here with us today. Um, what we'd like to do is have all the members of Student Council come up. We'd like to have a, we have, one, we have a little gift for you, and two, we would like to take a, a photograph with you as well.
Yeah, maybe one more. Sorry, Mom. Yeah. 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 All right, we're going to move on to our non-action reports. Uh, at this time, the board would like to recognize all the students who are part of PTA Reflections. The board would like to recognize the students in District 58 who submitted works of art and choreography, film production, literature, music composition, photography, and visual arts for this year's PTA Reflections competition. This year, 44 students and 48 project submissions will advance to the regional level of the competition. So congratulations to all of those students. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, the spotlight on our schools with the health and wellness update by Todd Drayfall. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, joined by Mark White, uh, who is one of our committee members uh, and executive uh, member of the DGEEA. Uh, so the committee has been going on for over a year now. Uh, we've done, I think, one of these last uh, winter. and. Uh, wanted to give you an update as to the, what progress uh, in this area uh, since then and uh, it's been kind of an exciting piece because we've just finished open enrollment and I have to say when you go through this you'll find this has probably been the most active comprehensive impactful open enrollment that I've seen um, in, in a long time or ever uh, in the number of people who went through and saw presentations and uh, were engaged in the process. So we were really excited about that and thanking everyone in, on the committee for their, their work. I want to throw, we're finishing up this presentation last week and I did a quick Google search of healthcare costs and this was in the top 10, these, these, uh, these headlines were in the top 10 list so as to understand we all know costs increase and in, 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 in issues that are coming up, but it was an interesting piece of a mix of um, impact to employers, impact to families. Uh, two of these were actually, when you see tax commissioner forecast school taxes increasing by 6%, and you know, a big impact was due to health care, um, had little to do with education. Also, property tax forecasts at the bottom, 6% uh, increase, and it cited uh, reasons for health care. Uh, those are from the uh, state of Vermont. Um, those are, weren't from Illinois. Uh, so it is a nationwide thing as well as an interesting piece about transparency and, you know, and issues that come up. Uh, one of the things we talk about uh, in the committee uh, that our, our consultant, our third party consultant group of alternatives uh, brings to the committee every, every month or every other is overall information in, of, about what's happening uh, nationally um, in health care uh, and, and those things that impact um, costs and changes in things so the committee gets you know an educational piece and I mean we all get an educational piece as to all of these things and how they're happening and and what that means and and it helps us in looking at ways to to manage that and to to help drive those pieces and, and to talk about ways to change turn over to Mark for the next few slides of talking about. Absolutely. So just this bit of an overview of what's going to clean up within the presentation. So we're going to first talk, talk about the charge of the committee. The work that we've done since the committee was, was put together. Um, Todd's going to go over our claim data and the update. And it's, thanks for that. Um, we're going to review the open enrollment. I just want to echo what Todd has said. It was a very powerful piece. And, and you know, as the DGEA uh, negotiation chair, I have to thank our administration for providing those opportunities for our association uh, leadership to get out to each of our buildings to engage with their membership and to drive that open enrollment to a very positive place. Um, and we're talking about some of the changes that are coming up over the, over the past year and what we might be doing in the future. So, we wanted to charge the committee. 
you know, this was set up as part of the negotiation process uh, during our last DGEA contract. This was one of the pieces that was added into our contract to add this committee to kind of restructure our health care committee. Um, we've added in members from each of the other associations who are under contract with the district, as well as three administrators and one of your board members uh, who's present for our meetings. So a lot of the work that we've done, you know, it, it's been a lot. We have been super engaged with the conversations. Uh, the Wellness Initiative is being launched presently, and we had a great turnout for the screening for our very first one. Uh, we had a lot of members show up to get their blood drawn, get a, a wellness check, and have those results sent on to their personal doctors so they can follow up and make sure that they're being as healthy as they possibly can. The Lobongo program to help reduce costs that are diabetic. Uh, membership is rolling out in January. There was a lot of work with Mike Baker from Group Alternatives to bring that to us as a way to bring some cost savings to the district. Um, he, like, you know, everything that he, he comes with, we are open ears and ready to dig into it and see if it's going to be viable for us. This one is hopefully going to work very well. Um, and I'm excited to see what happens when, when that does fully roll out. Um, the open enrollment aligning to our adjustments in January is going to be a really big deal. So that, when, you know, as Todd was saying, the open enrollment was very powerful. And next year, when we have our rate adjustments happen at the same time as open enrollment, people can make informed decisions about which health care plan they want and have that decision fall into place within a couple of weeks, really, quite honestly, rather than six months later in July. So that's a, a nice piece that's coming into place right now. Um, and then the last one, the men member education, which has really been ongoing. And we are really hoping to ramp it up significantly this coming year in 2020. We've made some progress with that. We've had some good results. Uh, we know we can do more with that. Um, we know our members are really anxious to get the information. That the, 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 what we received from them, the information we got when we were at the, at the buildings, Andy and, and myself and Craig and many other, uh, uh, several other leadership, it was overwhelming how much information they want. They truly are digging into their own claims and their own information, and they want to know how to make better choices. They want to know how to do better healthcare consumers, but they need help doing that. And that's one thing that our committee is going to work really hard on starting with our next meeting, to get that information into the hands of our members in a way that's very easily accessible and they can act, take action on to bring our costs down. Because they are learning, and that was another thing we did with the education program, was to really teach people what it meant to be a self-insured district. You know, often people think about insurance, oh, it's free money. It's free money, I get as much as I want. You know, use it up. <laughs> we use up our insurance, and you know, we want people to get, get, go to the doctor and get treatment. But if we're just, you know, spending willy-nilly, it comes right out of our pockets because we're funding it with our payroll contributions and with the, the money for the district. And that message is really resonating with our membership. Um, and that's, I think, why they're really open to the ideas of how to save uh, on, on the consumers. Fantastic. So the committee work is extensive. We dig into some really deep, detailed numbers every single month. We're looking at, the, at each of the claims. We're looking at the trends. Um, we're looking at options that we can use to control costs. Mike Baker and his team has done a great job of bringing us information of ways to do that. Obongo is just one little example. Uh, shipping our RX benefits as a provider is another example. Um, and just at the last one, he gave us a ton of information about RX because RX is going to be an issue the way the prices keep rising. And we don't have control over that as a nation. The consumers are kind of at the, at, at, at the mercy of, of those companies. Um, but he has some ways for us to, to dig into that. And that's one of the next things we're looking at is how we can make more steps to reduce that. So we're constantly looking at things, and, and the conversations are rich. They're intense. Um, there's a lot on the line. So we are, we are really getting into some really thick conversations that are providing um, meaning and progress towards our goal as a team to control those costs for the benefit of the whole district, and primarily our students. So I know that uh, most people cannot, or anyone, can read the R chart that's out there. Uh, it, you know, and, and there is in your board packet the, um, the monthly report of, that is easier to read for you. Uh, I just want to give an example. So this is the summary of the universal of all of the plans put together. Uh, the committee each month gets you know, six tables that looks like this, four or five tables that looks like this, um, and looks at what the claim data is doing. Uh, and goes through those. Uh, 
we are having a la we are having a much we're having a better year than we had last year. Uh, claims last month or so went up a bit, but we started off in a much better position this year than we did uh, last year. A lot of it was well a large uh, large claims um, that hit us uh, last year. Uh, some of those are not coming in as much, but also I think there's some management and some adjustments. We'll see uh, some of those pieces that we're making that we've that those tweaks to the plan that I think have helped some of this as well. Um, so we want to just kind of put that as an example for you to see. Um, this is our, our current projection chart, and actually, I this is helpful to look at at a at a high level. It also is sometimes deceiving to break it up in this format and. We're looking at some different uh, data analysis um, with with Mike that in the next few months with group alternatives, we may have some different looks at the how, how some of this um, we look at on a monthly or semi-annual basis. But as of right now, we are ahead of projection um, by a little bit, uh, and that's always good news. So it's always, we want to see you know, the green side, um, you know, because as a self-insured plan, when we do a, a, a premium increase the following year, uh, we obviously have to cover for the inflation piece and what we anticipate those things to be going out in the for going out in the future. But if we've come, if we're behind, we have to make up that difference. We, you know, we act in not unlike an insurance company. Uh, when you, if we had a fully insured plan, where they would look to make up that, you know, that loss, um, you know, if there was one. So, uh, seeing green is always a good thing. Open enrollment update. Uh, we've just concluded open enrollment. Uh, we kind of go back to some of the informational pieces. We started in August at, um, at opening day and had 10 or 15 minutes with, uh, at the end of each day at the Institute with uh, both um, Mark and Andy and, and, and I think Craig and others, uh, as well as I think Justin and everyone kind of went in and, and just kind of talked a little bit about some educational pieces and had a flyer how to use the Aetna app to look and price um, health care. Health care now is very much shifted, and it's shifted the last five years. It's shifted from 10 years ago, where people it's in, need to become more consumers and look for pricing. The example we always use is to go to a hospital for an MRI can cost $1,500, $1,800. To go to a standalone MRI clinic can be seven, uh, 800 or, or less. Uh, and Obviously, you know, when people are paying a percentage of that, but also the plan is paying the, you know, the 90% the of that, it has an impact. And so uh, using uh, the insurance app, uh, our third-party administrator for our plan is Aetna. Uh, they have an app, and you can price check, like anything else, uh, services. And so you can go online and see what MRI costs uh, close to you and go to a, and book you know, your appointment at a MRI clinic with your prescription uh, from your doctor and it is the same machine as uh, other places as a hospital might have, just different pricing. So we talked about that a little bit in, in, you know, at the beginning of the year. And then in open enrollment we had um, time at the beginning, or sorry, at the end of a, a couple days where uh, we got a chance to talk to and do a quick presentation to all of the certified staff. We had a presentation to all the instructional aides. Uh, we had two separate presentations to cover uh, custodial maintenance staff before and after school for uh, accommodating schedules. And then, uh, and as well as a uh, meeting with the principals, a uh, principals meeting. And I think one of the most successful items uh, was the time that we had um, with going out at lunchtime. And, and Craig and I went out a few places. Uh, Mark and Andy were out with Jane. Um, Kevin, I think, was out and, and just talked to staff and answered questions uh, on what, you know, on, on information that they've all received at that point. We, we emailed out the whole presentation to them ahead of time, several times, and so forth. Um, we also had some drop-in times at the end of Open Enrollment the last week uh, at ASC, and we always had someone in there uh, for half hour or better uh, asking questions. One of the things we look at is to our success point is um, we have a, a, an online portal that people need to go through and uh, click through and approve their uh, renewals. They don't have to. Their insurance will just roll over. 
Uh, in 2018, open enrollment, we had 104 people actively go through that process and do that. Uh, this year, we had 456. So uh, that is outstanding. <laughs> we were, we were kind of, um, uh, and it saved, I will tell you, it saved a lot of staff time on, on our office because someone else has to go do that. Um, and it's a, it's a bit more work when one person has to go through all of those open enrollments and check through them. Um, so that shows that we were getting that information out and, and, and people were responding to it. So we were excited about that piece. From a standpoint of change, we had uh, 50 people change from the PPO plan. Off of that plan, uh, we had uh, some people change from the reduced uh, and from the high deductible plan. Uh, and we had 57 new people to the HSA. So we had a huge shift and a huge change and, and a lot of people choosing uh, that item. I mean, one of the when things that we've set up uh, last year uh, was to have options for people, the HSA versus the PPO, um, and we, you know, a lot of our educational piece for this open enrollment was about explaining the HSA and what that meant <coughs> and how that worked. So we did have a 5% increase in uh, people in, in people choosing the insurance um, from prior years. So we have more people as of January 1st on the plan uh, than we did and you know, than we do currently. So which with all that communication piece is, you know, is a piece that's going to happen. Also additionally, one of the things, and I was worried we were going to lose this, um, we, the, the district set up an optional life insurance. Um, it's a guaranteed life open enrollment. Uh, we did the first open enrollment in March. Um, the, the life insurance company, had, we had a smaller amount of people choose it. Uh, they gave us the option of having another open enrollment process, which is not normal to have that guaranteed. You have up to um, $500,000, I'm sorry, $200,000 or five times your, your income, depending on uh, whichever is less. Um, we had, and we tried to get out communication, but we weren't sure how much was going to get lost in that whole process. We had 66 people. Uh, choose to to buy that piece, and it's one of those things that we look at as a financial um, bur uh, financial net for people uh, when looking at that piece as to you know if they need to add that uh, for coverage for loved ones and so forth. So we're we were it's a it's an added uh, benefit has no cost to the district, um, but it, it allows people to make those choices. It is also a far more inexpensive format, and it's a guaranteed piece. You don't have to fill out a survey or anything like that, uh, as opposed to the flyers that you may get in the mail type of thing, or someone that comes in, you know, into your home and, and wants to talk to you about life insurance. <coughs> Cost management pieces. Um, we had, uh, as we know, the $200 ER copay was added to the PPO plan uh, in January. We wanted to see how that was, what, what changes that has gone. Also, uh, on March 1st, we had a, uh, the new prescription benefits manager that, that came in. Uh, we switched from one to, to, to Caramark. Uh, and then Teladoc, which is a, a call-in piece that people can utilize um, and get some prescriptions called into them. They don't have to go see a doctor. They don't have to go to urgent care. Uh, they can just call in and, and go through, and a doctor will call them back uh, within usually about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and uh, go through it, and they will make some recommendations. It may be, you know, you need to go urgent care, or it may be uh, we're going to call something in for you. So on the ER visits, uh, from January 2018 to August 18, uh, the total cost was $362,000. From that same period of time in 2019, it was 291000 down $70,000. Uh, so we can see that people are, you know, that that is doing what it was supposed to do. Um, an ER visit at the time costs only the 10% piece that people are on the PPO, but it can cost the plan $1,500. ER is the most expensive place to receive uh, care. It is an important place to go when you need emergency assistance and emergency uh, coverage. It isn't always the best place to go for um, 
things that may not be that case. So, if, if, I, if I could just add a quick, just something anecdotal, just having talked to our members, both myself and other members uh, of our leadership team, and I've heard from members directly, oh, I remember hearing that, that the ER is a really expensive place to go, so I went to urgent care instead. It's like, awesome. Mm -hmm. This is the, the education piece our members really are looking for, because you know many people grew up like, you just go to the ER, and, and it's, it's very different. It's, it's, it's a great way to save some money. And so it is nice to see that, and I'm hopeful that as we continue that education piece, you can drive that number even further down. Prescriptions. Again, I know this is kind of hard to read. The important piece here is the bottom chart. And that is because we only have, since March, on the new plan, and this is only through August, um, but the important average prescript, the average prescript last year over 12 month period was $181 with the old um, pharmacy manager. Uh, that's down to $136 uh, per script. So that's a big piece. Um, prescription, uh, health, prescriptions and, and pharmaceuticals, the fastest growing area of cost in health care. Uh, one, one of the nice things about Affordable Care Act for individuals is there are no more limits, lifetime limits on health care insurance. However, that also means that there are almost no limits on sometimes the cost of prescriptions because that is sometimes the most expensive pieces now. Um, and there are more and more expensive pieces. So we, this is something that we keep looking at. I think we spend uh, 20 minutes or better every meeting talking about something about uh, prescription management. Teladoc. Teladoc is a piece that we have done a lot of communication pieces. We have raffles as to so many people sign up and we'll, we, um, we get some $10 gift cards and, and pull raffles. Uh, I think we probably have one maybe coming up soon. Uh, we've had a, a significant increase in um, that participation over the last year uh, as, we, as we move through that piece. So those are the areas that we're working on and continually pushing uh, to find savings. And then the wellness screening right now we have as of Friday 181 people have gone through that. Uh, this is something the board approved uh, last year. Uh, anyone, employee and or spouse that goes through it, uh, they go through the, there's I think a 50 question survey that they answer, they have some blood work. Um, and then um, they will get mailed to them at the end of the, the whole thing, a $100 gift card. Uh, CHC is our, our vendor that is helping run this. We will get, the committee will get those results. Uh, it goes through the 18th. We'll get those results. And then from there, we will look to see what we need to do to start looking at wellness incentives. Because you know, we're looking at short-term cost savings, and we're you know, utilizing those. We need to look for long-term. Uh, because the best way to manage these health care costs is to not have to use them as much as possible. And so wellness incentive pieces and, and those type of things are going to be our next steps. I think. That is it. Looks like it's it. Questions? Wonderful. No, I just want to say uh, thanks to both of you guys. Thanks to both of you guys for the, and, and everybody on your team. I know you guys in this first year have hustled really, really hard to get this to work. And I know that uh, working hard this year is going to help build a formula for success in educating everybody and, and, and getting this moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also just like to. Um, <clears throat> reiterate that, but also dwell on, on the education piece. And Mark, I, I've heard you say in the meetings time and again how important that is for you to spearhead, spearhead that as a union leader. So thank you to you and to Andy and the rest of your, your team. Thank you to uh, Jane and to Todd for their leadership as well. Um, the evidence is clearly here that you guys did a, fa a fabulous job in helping your members make really important decisions and make really important informed decisions, and I, I appreciate that greatly. Thank you. And I can't agree more. This is a partnership we need to have yeah. to build stronger to get that education out there and you know, to support our community. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, so, you. Much. so much. Okay, listed on tonight's agenda are six communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right. With that, we'll start with the reports to the board, starting with uh, uh, Dr. Russell and the superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Well, thanks. I'd like to once again thank our Bel Air staff, uh, Ms. Diner, Ms. Fulton. Thank you for all the work for Student Council. Ms. Borchelle, thank you for your leadership. And I know Ms. Berger just left, but please thank her. And then, of course, all the students for all their hard work. It was a great presentation, and we really appreciate it. Moving on to the curriculum and instruction uh, portion of my report, I want to thank uh, Mr. Sissel and the entire uh, teaching and learning team from the ASC for putting on a fantastic Institute Day on uh, the tw or excuse me on uh, December 2nd the uh, district hosted a Teachers Institute Day at Onum Middle School the day was filled with professional growth sessions that centered on math science English language arts technology and much more I want to thank our presenters especially the staff that presented for this Institute Day uh, our staff are just a, a great group of professionals and uh, they really did an outstanding job bringing all of this great learning uh, to our teachers and to our support staff. So thank you very much. I have an update from Mr. Sissel regarding math materials for public display. As the board is aware, the math committee is currently engaged in a robust pilot process. We look forward to hearing about their work over the past uh, several years at the January 2020 board meeting at Spotlight and anticipate pending committee consensus a recommendation for action slash adoption slash purchase of new curricular resources as early as the February 10th regular board meeting. Because of the timing, we're going to go ahead and put both sets of materials on public display. Not that the committee is recommending that we'll have two sets of math materials, we're just gonna have one, but because of the timing and to make sure that the public can view those, we wanna make sure that we get those up on public display. So those will be available at the Downers Grove Public Library and then of course at uh, the Longfellow Center too if anybody needs it there. But primarily, we'd ask our people uh, and um, our, our taxpayers to go to uh, the Downers Grove Public Library to uh, get those. Yes. Oh, excuse me, I misspoke, the ASC as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, under finance, uh, just reporting back to the board, the tax levy previously approved by the Board of Education has been received by the DuPage County Clerk's Office. By law, the board must file the tax levy by the last Tuesday in December, so thank you to the entire business office for making that happen. Every once in a while, you read in the news about a district who forgot to file that, and then their levy is invalid. So that's something that we always double and triple check to make sure. So we've met that deadline, and I always like to inform the board of that. Um, in terms of facilities, we are continuing to work with Representative Stava Murray. Mr. Drayfall and myself will be meeting with the representative next week to hear an update on playgrounds. Uh, we hope that there's some movement going on in Springfield, and we'll continue to update uh, not only our building leaders, but also our PTAs on any progress that we learn of. So hopefully we'll have another follow-up right before winter break. In terms of public relations, I'm very excited to report that the Citizen Task Force will have its first meeting next Wednesday night. I know that's been a long time coming. And then uh, for those of you in the audience and, and listening or watching at home, what the Citizen Task Force is, our community got together and wrote a strategic plan that identified several areas, but with regard to facilities, they wanted to look at several things with our facilities and then they asked for a draft master facility plan to be created from that. Uh, that's been presented to the board over the spring and then the summer and so now it's the work of this task force to really take that work uh, that the, uh, that's included in that draft plan and make recommendations to the Board of Education to finalize that plan and give the board all the information they need should the board choose to act on uh, a part or all of that plan. So that work uh, begins next Wednesday. We're very excited for that. Uh, we've got a group of about 40 individuals who have committed to being on that from across our community. And that group consists of current uh, District 58 parents, um, previous District 58 parents, District 99, uh, personnel and District 99 parents who live in District 58 and also some civic leaders from around the town and also people who do not have children in District 58 but live within our borders of uh, the school district. So we're very excited for that uh, work. We will, uh, through Megan Hewitt, continue to update the community on the work of the task force and then the board can anticipate that in the superintendent's report and other areas in uh, subsequent board meetings that you will be getting updates on the work of the task force. So we're very excited to kick that off next week at Longfellow. Personnel, I want to just inform the board and thank our Education Foundation. Uh, we've been passing out our Green Apple Awards, which is a really nice thing that I get to do as the superintendent. I get to go and, and meet with teachers and uh, support staff and congratulate them. Uh, and it's a great opportunity that our staff and parents have to recognize the great work of our teaching staff and our support staff. We couldn't do it without them, and we're just so thrilled of all the uh, hard work and, and the recognition that our staff deserves. So that's always been fun. We will get a list to the board of all the Green Apple winners um, in January 2020, and then we'll get another final list at the end of the school year. So thank you to all those staff members and parents who are recognizing our staff for a job well done. 
Technology, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Eichmiller for putting this portion of the report together. We are in the middle of winter map testing. In preparation for testing, the technology department checked operating systems for necessary updates and pushed out updated versions of both the iOS and Chrome kiosk app. If you remember last year, we had some uh, technical difficulties. I'll, I'll, I'll say that with some of our testing. And so I want to thank James and his entire department for really um, putting a lot of things in place at the start of testing. It doesn't mean that everything always goes perfect in testing, but uh, thank you, Dr. Eichmiller, for really making sure that we were up and ready to go, um, and especially to all of our building principals, because they're wearing about 80 different hats each day, and that's another hat that they wear as map testing coordinator. So I know many of them are in the audience. We really appreciate that. We'll give you a full report once testing is concluded in terms of how successful we were, but um, so far, so good. Of course, I always worry as the superintendent saying that, because you know what will happen tomorrow morning, uh, but so far, so good with all of that. In terms of student services, um, for the full report, uh, we will issue a, um, you know, a, a detailed list about physical restraints rules in Illinois. But there has been a, a, a big ProPublica article that's been pushed out across the state of Illinois about um, some really terrible things that have taken place in some of the schools in Illinois uh, regarding how children are restrained or sent to seclusion or sent to timeouts. I'm very pleased to report that District 58 does not engage in any of those practices. We never have and we never will. Uh, there are times where it does become necessary for the safety of a student or the safety of the class to restrain a child. However, anyone who restrains a child in District 58 does so for the safety of the child and is properly trained under CPI, which is a technique that we use that's approved by the State Board of Education to do that. If that ever takes place, the parents are notified and a detailed log of all of that is um, kept. So I want to assure everyone uh, that while this has been really a horrific story that we've all read throughout the state, District 58 does not engage in that, and I want to also thank Mrs. Stewart for all of her work in this area. She's done a really nice job um, getting information out there for our Board of Education and for our public uh, to make sure that everyone knows that our kids are our most precious commodity and we would never engage in any of, any of the things that were mentioned in that article. Uh, other than that, I can't believe we're here, but winter break is uh, about two weeks away. It doesn't feel like that, although I think when we step outside tonight, it's going to feel like that because I know <laughs> the temperature is dropping by the minute. Uh, but we hope everyone has a great chance to unwind over winter break. We want to wish everyone happy holidays. And again, just thank everyone for all of their hard work. It, it, it does seem like the start of school was yesterday, although sometimes it seems like it was eight years ago. But the school year does move very quickly. And we're um, very happy to get this uh, well-deserved break for our staff coming up here in, in a couple of weeks. But we're not quite there yet. We've got a lot of work to do in these next two weeks. But again, happy holidays on behalf of all of us in District 58. That concludes the superintendent's report. Anyone have any questions? All right. Thank you very much. And welcome back. <laughs> Some monthly visits here with Todd Dreyfus. I've, I've used my allotted time for the night. Yeah. Uh, year to day reports in, in there, uh, it's trending as it normally is. Uh, there's uh, expenditures slightly behind, but that's because we uh, had a transportation bill that didn't come to us. Uh, that gets caught up. Uh, after your approval of the bills, uh, revenue is running a little slightly ahead of uh, curve average, uh, which is good. Uh, but overall, I think we're in pretty good shape for the year-to-date report as far as expenses. We're about 42% through the fiscal year. Also in the re uh, monthly reports are two uh, memos uh, for the board. Uh, one is um, about the property tax relief grant. State of Illinois has allocated uh, $53 million for property tax relief for schools. Um, we have done the analysis uh, according to what the state, the estimates that the State uh, Board of Education puts out. Um, as we understand the grant and the information and structure, uh, the district would have to, uh, in applying for it, would have to abate if it was, you would apply for the grant. If you receive the grant, then you must abate your property taxes, um, the abatement, the maximum abatement is $1.88 million per year. Uh, we would have to do that for two years. The return on that, as we understand it, is about three hundred and fifty dollars or $333,000 uh, from the state. That goes into uh, the state revenue forever, uh, but that would leave us a million five short. Um, for two years um, in covering expenses. 
Um, everyone has very high, in the state of Illinois, property taxes are the largest piece, particularly for us, the largest piece of funding. Um, everyone has a, has a significant tax bill. Uh, we comparatively, uh, Downers Grove comparatively has a much smaller limiting rate than many other school districts. Even if we were, even if we were to recommend, which we would not recommend given those, that math, to apply for the grant, the chances of receiving it are incredibly slim uh, because there are many, many other places that have a significantly higher portion uh, for example, you know, I live in West Aurora. Um, their grant maximum, the differential is only a couple hundred thousand dollars on, a ten, on ten million dollars. So if they applied, they could abate ten million dollars and get, uh, or they could get ten. They could abate ten point five and get ten million. Um, and, you know, and, and then that goes into their base. So, you know, there's, there's, and I don't even know if they're on the top list of of districts that would um, receive it. Additionally, there is only $53 million uh, available uh, for this funding. So um, we've done math we would not recommend at this time, uh, given the uh, significant reduction in resources that would be available for the district. Um, it would be you know, a, a piece that we would certainly have to significantly reduce uh, expenditures to, to be able to cover uh, that shortfall. Um, so there's that memo in that. Uh, additionally, there is a memo um, of something that's that come up. We can have a conversation about uh, in January, and then for board approval in February, uh, specific to the sup uh, supplemental bond uh, levy. Uh, back in 2013, um, a bond was approved that was that ended up being higher than um, the limiting piece, uh, and so that has been adjusted as inflation has allowed the district to increase that, um, supplemental levies can be applied to so that we can uh, make up for that debt payment. And you'll see if you look in your year-to-date report, your cash balance on the debt service fund, it is currently negative because we've made that December payment. Um, and it will be negative until the spring tax collection. Um, that's, that's not a normal thing. Uh, normally you don't go uh, in the hole in that. So that's due to that, that fix which we can fix over time as inflation allows us to increase that piece. And, and in the memo explains the differentials and the fact that it's a, it's a small impact overall. So those are what's in the monthly report. Unless there's any questions on those. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Darren. The three of us are whispering over here. Isn't there some point early in the meeting where you ask people more people public comment as the the kind of I forgot we have cut on the script. So we're gonna have to add it back in because we we're making changes. Can we say something now? Just to think everybody wants to fill out a card and Yeah, I can certainly. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about right now is uh, normally up front we would remind you and uh, we didn't is that uh, anybody that's wishing to make a public comment today, we will in, in just a just a little bit here have an opportunity for anyone out in the crowd today to provide public comment to us. Uh, if you are interested in doing that, we ask that you please fill out a card and turn it in over in the basket all the way over there to my right so that we make sure that we allocate enough time and that we get to everybody. And we also like to have the opportunity to follow up with you if necessary. So there's an opportunity for you to provide an email address as well. Thank you for reminding me. With that, we're going to move on to our committee reports. Uh, first up, we have our policy committee, which met on November 19th. With Tracy Warner. Um, I'll start and you, yeah, yeah, is that no cool? Yeah. Uh, so we met on November 19th and Jill wasn't there that day, so I had to assume the reins of the meeting. Um, we had Ken Carter from the IASB Policy Services come and talk to us about the process of going to Press Plus, which we've talked about in the last two meetings, I believe, um, and how we're going to go through the policy manual customization. Um, to align it with, if, if give us an opportunity to customize it um, and add on to uh, any potential things that are particular to our district. Um, so we're going to break into some subgroups as well to have a chance to go through um, surveys and is it, is it considered a survey? We'll uh, go through some yeah, questionnaire. Questionnaire. Mm -hmm. um, 
to go through the questionnaire so that we can bring this information back to the IASB policy services for them to go ahead and help put together the final product of our new press manual that we're hoping to have completed and adopted by June of 2020. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that? No. Nope. So we're I, underway until yeah, next month. So we're month. underway, and, and this committee is so dedicated to board policy that they've scheduled an extra meeting in December, and so we'll be meeting Wednesday morning. <laughs> so hopefully um, we'll have some more information at the next meeting after we go through the breakout groups. The only other thing I would add is that um, we have had several concerns about head lice in, in our community this year, and I know this is not everyone's favorite uh, subject to talk about, but um, you know, being an elementary school district, this is a topic that no matter what district I've worked in, we have had this conversation about this time of year uh, with hats and gloves and, and uh, you know, all those. So this is a good reminder to tell children not to share uh, winter hats and gloves and those types of things. Um, but um, we are, uh, the policy committee did talk about the policy in general, and then some of the procedures that we use as an admin team to really follow up with that and, and there was a a lot of talk about when parents are notified we, we had several parents um, request to us that um, we increase our notification to instead of waiting till there's a cluster to once there's a case in a grade level to just send out a reminder to all the families and um, the administration talked to our building principals on Friday and that is the change that we're going to be making and um, we still have to meet with our nurses and go over some of those things but the, the policy committee did recommend that once there's an identified case and, and I say that the way we define an identified case is that the nurse at the school is aware of it and has reported it. Um, then we'll go ahead and send a letter out um, to everyone in that uh, grade level. Of course, we're not going to be for student privacy uh, identifying the class, or you know, we would never identify the student, of course. And then if we have it in multiple grade levels across the school, we would send a note out to all families in that uh, school. So we want to thank our community for bringing that concern, um, and also the policy community for being so responsive uh, to those requests from our parents. And, and of course, thank all the individuals and buildings who will help us implement that. Well said. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys very much. We I think we're all excited for the changes that are coming with uh, Press Plus. So. Um, all right, the Legislative Committee did meet on November the 20th. Karat is not here, but Emily, are you going to? Sure. Um, actually, I was not at this meeting of the Legislative Committee, so I mean, I could speak, but you might be no, there. No, so I, I, I can't be there. Okay, so, um, you know, I was also at that meeting as well. Tonight, um, unfortunately. <laughs> that's okay. Um, at the Legislative Committee, we went over the votes uh, that. Karat would have made on behalf of the Board of Education at the Illinois Association of School Boards uh, Delegate Assembly at the IIII Conference um, the Saturday before uh, Thanksgiving. So we went over that and asked if there were any questions. And then the biggest portion of the meeting is something that's unique to District 58. District 58 holds a legislative breakfast and we invite District 99 and all the feeder schools into District 99 for our local uh, leaders. And so that includes everyone from village leaders to state representatives and state senators and then of of course, we'll invite uh, you know uh, representatives in Congress and the Senate to also come. Uh, the higher up they go, the less likely they can actually attend because they may be out of town. But we are starting that, and we will get the date out there for um, the representatives and senators as soon as possible. And uh, one group I also failed to mention is we invite our representatives on the county board as well to come. And it's a great opportunity for us to talk directly to our legislators about things that are impacting District 58 and the town of Downers Grove. So we're excited to have our legislative breakfast. Uh, we are also going to add in a snow date in the event that we get snowed out on the first one, we would ask the representatives to hold uh, both dates, but we'll see how that goes. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, last year we did get, was it last year? No, the year before that we got snowed out, right? February tends to be one of those months where you, uh, you know, yeah. it's too cold or snow yeah. or something. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. All right, and the Financial Advisory Committee did not meet uh, since the last board meeting, but the district leadership team did. Um, just kind of as a reminder to everybody, the district leadership team was created after the meet and confer committee to, to, to kind of follow up and, and manage and maintain and, and sort of oversee the progress on the strategic plan. So uh, we sort of have the same standing agenda every time, which kind of breaks up into the three sections that you would see um, in, that we've talked about today um, with connecting to the community, uh, the, the, the rigor and the, um, our facilities. But so this week, uh, we really, this meeting was uh, very 
informative. We really dove into a lot of things. We started off with the focus on learning and we focus on the fact that the rigor has been defined, but the, sort of that process that we're going to go through of promoting the culture of rigorous is going to be a thing that we probably see in the green forever online and probably is something that is going to be ongoing even beyond this uh, strategic plan. It's just one of those things that is going to constantly uh, have to be revisited and making sure that we're doing that. It'll be an ongoing process. But so far, um, they're really excited about the progress that they're making. Uh, Justin's team has been working on um, the rigor of the assessments and the alignment of getting those our internal assessments over to the state standards, making sure that, that they're sort of a good, uh, good predictor that we're, we're, we're meeting the state standards. Uh, last year, the instructional model committee focused on that middle school model, what's going on in sixth or eighth grade, what's going on educationally there. This year, they're going to really be focusing more broadly on just the overall quality that's going on uh, throughout the district in general. Uh, the curriculum committee worked on uh, a curricular review timeline. And this is, this is so that we can have an ongoing view where we're constantly reviewing all of the curriculum that we, that we have in, uh, in the district and go beyond just the core curriculum that we're spending so much time talking about right now and purchasing, but also looking at supplementary um, curriculum as well as technology and how that stuff works and making sure that we're constantly reviewing that and making sure that we're doing it in the, in the right way. And we spent a lot of time talking about looking at support structures, not only for the students and even the staff, but talking as well about how, uh, what kind of support structures we can have for the parents as well, which I know, you know, it, it, it's not 1986 anymore where the kid asks a question, you're like, Go play for five minutes while I read the book, and then, then I can help you. There, you know, it, it, it's now, you know, we got to figure out exactly, you know, exactly what we need to teach them in the right format. And so, what tools are out there? What curriculum components come with the the stuff that we're purchasing? From there, we moved on to our, our communication group, and we're continuing to, to institute that district-wide um, plan um, for communication. Uh, we've seen the implementation of that weekly email from the principals, uh, but also a major upgrade or kind of a reboot of the staff email, which I'm sure another one may have gone out since that meeting, but I know that you said that one had a 73% open rate, which, was, which is very good. Um, and so with that, the superintendent staff's um, communications council is going to sunset. Obviously, at any point, any of these committees that, or councils that were sunsetting at any point can be spun back up if necessary, but the idea was a lot of these, there was a lot of councils that were created right out of the strategic plan to sort of get our footing and set it forward. Obviously, anybody who's listened to any of the big updates knows there's a ton of them and, and we're going to burn people out if they go on in perpetuity. So, so that one is sunset. Um, the, the superintendent's uh, community advisory council has been discussing improving the website. So they're looking for better flow, things like that, uh, as well as the ability to have search capabilities. And they were also talking about things where when we get submitted questions from the community, maybe having a section where we can post that kind of stuff online. Um, so th they're, they're in the process of mocking up some ideas and things like that. The current website that we have may not be capable of actually handling that, but it's something that we may have to address uh, as we move uh, further on um, down the line. Uh, the Communications Feedback Council has also a sunset. That one um, is now going to just, as part of the strategic plan, there was, it was determined that we were going to create a new council afterwards to sort of follow up and review any feedback that we got. We decided that it was a little bit redundant because they would review it and then give it to the district leadership team who would then review it, who would then give it to the board. So we're going to sort of skip that step. We're going to jump to just the district leadership team going ahead and reviewing uh, things like our surveys and stuff like that, and then that stuff would come to the, come to the board. Uh, then the last part of the communication piece was the resource review council, which looks at uh, the staffing, the class size, the organizations, and structures in general. So the, a big consensus that came out of that was the idea that we would move away from ever recommending combination classrooms. Um, that, that sort of the popularity of those has been diminishing over the last few years anyway, but with sort of the change in rigor and change in curriculum, it just does not seem to make the same level of sense as it might have done a decade or so ago, plus it seems to be uh, pretty solidly agreed upon by our building leaders that that's not the direction they want to go anymore. So the recommendation is going to be to stay away from them. Um, but we also got into a discussion, one of the other recommendations they had was really looking at not going above 
you know, that 30 number in, in, um, in the classrooms for students. Um, this is, you know, there was some discussion, like, should we be looking at caps and, and things along those lines. With the, the, the conversation that happened in the district leadership team was, if we're pulling that, that combo class out of the mix as a potential option to fix, maybe we don't look at capping right away this year, but put some markers in place that if we, once we cross over past 29 and we get up into 30, that that triggers deeper conversations and evaluations and finding what we need to do. And, but not just putting this on the back burner for now, but having this be a conversation that over the next year or two we are really looking at because uh, um, this is something that we're getting some consensus on from our, our teachers and our building leaders that they would like, uh, like to see happen. So uh, that is something that we're going to have to look at. But th that holds a lot of impact, uh, too. We can't, there's no guarantee that we could just split a class. So we could be looking at doing what happened in Highland, where you know, it's a cap and, and, and transfer kind of thing. So that's a big impact on the community and everybody else. So at this point, we're just going to kind of have that be a trigger point where we look at things. Um, but it's something that over, I think is going to be something that we're going to want to discuss um, over the next uh, couple years. Um, the, the final piece was that securing the future. Uh, you know we're moving forward with that task force. It's about a week and a half away. We're going to be meeting with them. Um, following up with that is going to be some larger community events um, that will be put together. There will be uh, also some mailings that go out with some information as well as phone surveys. Um, and we're hoping to be gathering a lot of information from the community about um, all of the information that we put out from the strategic plan and trying to understand uh, where we're going forward and also review um, just all of the pressing needs that we have here in the district. So we're hoping to have all of that stuff kind of gathered and, and analyzed uh, to start analyzing in June. So I know that was a lot. So it was actually a very th real thorough meeting. Like, you know, the first one we come back, you know, it's kind of recapping over the summer and kind of setting goals for this year. Um, there was a lot of progress made. So it was a good meeting. Did I miss anything? No, that's, that was good. Okay. Any questions? All right. With that, move on to Greg Harris with the Health and Wellness Committee. Thank you. I'm going to keep this report pretty brief considering we haven't had a spotlight on the Health and Wellness Committee earlier in this meeting. Um, and actually, I'm just going to re reiterate one point and then bring up one other that Todd already mentioned. Um, one is that if you look at the figures that were provided to you in uh, claims in terms of uh, the total of medical and RX, um, you can see that we're running a little hot in October and in September. Um, however, the, the good news is that in the first two months of the fiscal year, July and August, we um, are way under where we were at the same time in 2018. So, um, so far, so good, knock on wood. Um, and then the other, the other point, which you probably don't see because I don't think this information is shared with the whole board because of the, of, um, the sensitivity of the data, but um, we have also seen a significant decrease in our number of large claimants. And um, so in terms of the spotlight, illustrated the things that we can control um, and, and the, the things that we're doing, the celebrations that we should um, be honoring in terms of the great work that we we're doing there. In terms of things that we can't directly control, we're also having a pretty good year as well. Anything to add there, Todd? Okay. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. All right, with that, then we're going to move on to our discussion items tonight. We have two items up for discussion. We're going to go ahead and start it off with our 2020-2021 school year calendar with Dr. Jane Uzentis. Tonight on the agenda, um, our hope is to briefly talk about calendar, what the proposal is. Um, I can answer questions of our board, and then we would like to bring a calendar for approval in January. Um, so you will see in the public content in board docs, there's our proposed District 58 calendar for next year, District 99's calendar, a calendar memo, and then also this very brief presentation that just shows the survey results from, from the three question survey. Um, historically, the start and end dates between 58 and District 99 have been different. The structures obviously are very different in the high school district versus an elementary district. Um, the high schools do have air conditioning, so starting earlier, earlier is not a problem. But the other reason for that, um, their start dates are as early as August 12th for their teachers is also the, the semester structure and wanting to finish fit final exams in before Christmas. Obviously, as an elementary district, we do not have that same structure. 
so we've typically started later. Um, at least for the last 10 years, as long as I've been in my current position, we have tried to align as closely as possible for the days off within the calendar, those holiday periods. Um, and then more recently, this last two years, District 58 did have the full week of Thanksgiving off. Um, District 99 did not. And as we are talking about calendar and our priorities, you know, we wanted to ask our parent community. Um, typically it's been, well, the priority is to make sure they're aligned. So we, we again, put together a three question survey. Um, is it a priority? You will see in this response, 46% of the parents said yes. Um, it is important to remember though that not all of our parents necessarily have children at the high school. Um, but still, the majority of our parents said yes, it's a priority. We wanted to ask very specific questions related to Thanksgiving and get feedback from parents. Next year, District 99 students will be in session that Monday and Tuesday, and that's how District 58's calendar used to be. Um, and so we are asking our parents, are you in support if we align in our in attendance during on the Monday and Tuesday? And you will see that 59% of our parents said yes, they are in support of changing back to uh, closer alignment over Thanksgiving. The third question um, was asking, and again, it's a, it, asking it differently, but similar question for the Monday and Tuesday, if they're days off, are you in support of that, even if it means that we would have to add days to the start or end of the calendar during the hotter months, which is what, which is what it would mean. Um, and 55% of our parents were not in support of that. So the majority of our parents really are in line with, um, let's, let's be aligned with the high school, let's go ahead and match Thanksgiving, even though the last two, the last two years, which was nice, I mean, we did get positive feedback from our staff and positive feedback from parents um, about liking that week. Of course, we also, it's very mixed feedback um, when you compare it to, do you still want the week off even if it means you have to go longer or start earlier in August? And our schools are very hot in August. There was not, uh, this survey, if you remember, was the Professional Learning Monday survey along with the calendar in one short survey. So the, this calendar topic for tonight and for January is we're not talking about the schedule for Professional Learning Mondays. That's not part of what the calendar will be approved in January. That's going to be a separate board presentation and question and answer from our board in February. So we've really separated those out. On the open-ended section for professional learning, a few parents put these comments in specific to the calendar, even though we didn't have open-ended. So I thought it was appropriate to at least share. Um, the, the few questions that came through or the few comments that came through or statements from our parents, um, if we're going to have the days off, consider them as institute days. Um, parent, a parent that wanted to suggest having the kids get out earlier in the summer, um, which and you can read them, the starting the school year on Monday, Tuesday for students and ending on a Thursday, Friday. That's an interesting one. We definitely get mixed feedback about, you know, one group of parents wants us to start and have a full week for kids. And then we also have parents saying that's just too long for kids to have that full week. And so we've been, you know, we've done, handled that differently different years. Definitely, we have, and the majority of our parents want the calendars to be aligned with the same days off. Um, a question was posed by a parent regarding the e-learning days. And um, at this point, District 58, we are not pursuing, we're not actively pursuing an e-learning day model. Um, there are districts out there, primarily high school, there are some elementary. And so at this point, we will learn from the districts who are exploring that. We are not at this time actively exploring e-learning days. Um, and that would definitely take a lot of work with staff and with parents and with kids. Um, and then the final comment from a parent was we don't, if we're taking the full week off at Thanksgiving, um, then we don't also need that Monday that was an added day off for our families when we hit an institute on that, on that Monday. So if you look, just a couple things to note in the calendar, and again, it's the feedback as we would expect is going to be mixed from staff. Um, definitely there are staff members that really appreciated that week off at Thanksgiving. That's a break. That's the end of our trimester. And so there's a ton of work to be done and it gives that little bit of a break. Um, there's also some mixed feedback looking in our calendar. Our, our teacher in service days in August, those first two days, 24th, 25th, the 26th, 
is not a work day for certified staff and it's not a student attendance day. And I think it's important, at least for our board to understand, our community to understand, that's a day for training for our instructional assistants. Um, and as, as hard as we have tried, it's, we really can't facilitate training for almost 400 certified staff plus another 150 on one day. And so we added that day because the training is very important for instructional assistants and we were just trying to figure out how to accommodate that and facilitate that training so it's meaningful um, and really just don't have enough of us to lead sessions to, to have both groups on that one day for a district day. So that's why, that's why students don't start then until the Thursday the 27th. At this point, are there questions for, from our board members? Any other information, any conversation? I have a clarifying question. Oh, sure. um, can you tell me the difference again, um, your perception of how questions two and three are different? Because I'm just, uh, like, the reason why I'm asking is because it's, um, for question two, okay, wait, it sorry. says 20% uh, put no. But then for question three, which is kind of asking a very similar question, but in reverse, uh, about a third said yes. So I'm not sure I'm clear on the distinct, clear enough on the distinction it, to understand what our parents are telling us here. So in this question, okay, sorry, I have to read it, it's long. It's, it's simply the, do we want to align um, the, the distinction, oh, sorry. In three is, do we want to align even, or do we still want them off, even if we want people to realize we would be adding days mm -hmm. to the calendar so even if it means adding days right do you still want kids home is it more important to you to have the kids home I guess I'm just surprised Monday, I'm surprised in the difference between no is for number two and yes is for number three because I would think that there would be I would think if families don't have us another child in 99 you're not even I mean I don't think about sure. that right now yeah. Yeah. or would it be no opinion like or that's no where opinion, that's right. where is that where it falls in no opinion sure. or is it the no I mean just it's just a, it's a long it's a long question mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that everybody understood what it was asking the question too. Well, I'll tell you I I an, answered it contradictory like because I didn't I didn't care I, I I didn't mind my kids having the entire week off and I didn't mm. mind if we were a little bit different than 99 yeah. um, I, I think I thought that was fine and the way that it impacts my family is not a big deal but when you ask me do I want that week off so that I but I'm, we're gonna go extra days in June that I would prefer anyway I mean like we have to do we have to hit us so, so many no no, no I'm saying but, each year but I'm saying would I rather have them then the yeah. extra couple days yeah. in in November would I rather have mm -hmm. those extra you know less days in June oh. I would prefer less days in June so I, I think that it makes sense to me because my brain when I looked at the questions I I would I would have answered opposite on okay. those just because that distinction for me but um, so and there, I mean I'm sure there's some people that just missed the distinction but yeah when you flip them but so I, I think that the data reveals that this is in the best interest of our community when I fully support that um, just to I guess play devil's advocate um, I'm just I'm, I'm fully support of, of alignment with 99 because I think that's that is um, I only have kids in 58 but I understand that a lot of other families have kids in both districts and they rely on the older 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 children to provide daycare for the younger children or at least some kind of supervision while parents leave early for work or whatever my only point which would be a concern is certain patterns have been established with families not just Thanksgiving which is relatively um, recent change but I think like just for example the the four-day weekend around Columbus Day as far as, as long as I've been in the district which is this is my fourth year I think we've had that so I'm just I'm just concerned about like families just keeping up with, with their routines and then missing days and pulling their kitchen days that were in previous years um, non attendance days um, but I, I think that that's um, that concern is not as um, significant as providing that alignment that our community desires between 99 and 58 Thank you, and that, that's a good point. It's one of our drafts we still had the Tuesday, and then again went to the, okay, if we're gonna be aligned, we should really move the October, the, the day for our staff to that October 23rd, and we also moved our November in-service to the January 4th, right after Christmas, right after winter break. Um, again, in the spirit of, okay, if we're gonna align, let's align. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, again, not, not accounting for the early release days um, or late start the high school is the late start. 
Are there other questions by our board? Our hope then would be for January, we'll be bringing a calendar for board approval. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. We have one more discussion item tonight. That's the 2020-2021 school fees uh, uh, with Katie Hannigan is gonna. Yeah, um, I, I can give the introduction to school okay. fees. Um, and then Katie, if you wanna jump in, if, you, if the board has any questions. Um, so school fees for this year, uh, we spent a lot of time working with the business office and just taking a look at, do we need to increase our school fees? And, and if so, by what? And um, what we've discussed as a um, administrative team is that we are very comfortable staying on the path of just increasing them by the CPI, which would be basically the, the expense that our um, uh, district incurs at, uh, you know, as revenues go up, or excuse me, as expenses go up. So at this particular point, we are just recommending an, uh, a modest increase of the consumer price index to um, our fees, which is probably gonna end up somewhere around uh, 2%. So we're not looking at a big jump. I do wanna point out to the board though, um, Fees are something that we are extremely sensitive to when you're signing your kids up for school. Uh, so we, we always take a look at it and we don't want to you know, arbitrarily increase those. We want to really re respect the taxpayer, respect our parents as they're going through all sorts of other expenses. That being said though, if technology and things like that were to skyrocket, then of course we would have to take a closer look at those fees. Um, we look particularly uh, at O'Keefe as another school fee that we want to make sure um, we're not overcharging parents, but definitely um, charging enough to maintain the program and to pay for the staffing uh, that that program costs. And then we look at preschool in a very um, similar way. So that's the recommendation for school fees uh, that will be coming up at an upcoming board meeting. So tonight you're not voting on anything, just an opportunity to give the business office uh, feedback. And Katie does uh, handle our fees. So if you have any questions, Katie would be happy to answer them. What is the, hello, <laughs> didn't see you pop up over there. What is the, um, the policy and procedure as far as families that are not able to pay the fees, especially for kindergarten since we, or the OKEEP, sure, since we are raising that? Okay. Yeah, we do absolutely allow for fee waiver applications. Um, we get a list from the state every month for students that are direct certified for fee waivers, and so anything that they might be assessed is waived for them. Aside from that, uh, we do allow for fee waivers for families, depending on extenuating circumstances, things like that, we have an application process. Uh, for most of our fees, if that application is approved, they are waived. For OKEEP specifically, they would have to fall within the state guidelines for free lunch. Uh, but if they do meet those guidelines, then OKEEP is also waived. And is that part of the registration packet that goes, now that everything's online? Yeah, the schools share that out with okay. all the families, absolutely. Thank you. And then Jill, um, just to follow up, as we switch to the press manual, that's exactly as it's written in press as well. So, so the current policy you have really aligns with what we would be um, officially adopting with our new manual. And just one more piece, and in, in O'Keefe we also have that option where people can pay it monthly as opposed to right. paying that fee up front. Yeah, we do break it out into 10 equal payments. Right. right. Thank you. Yes. So on the topic of O'Keefe, obviously there's a, a size of a, a jump that's more sure. is, yeah. is incre increased greater than CPI um, and, and the note the memo indicates that it is due to um, having to add positions mm -hmm. so when you are um, building a fee structure for next year but yet we don't have enrollment numbers yet for O'Keefe tell me about that how that works and that's exactly what wound up happening for this year in fact mm -hmm. so you'll notice so we're, we're playing catch up basically exactly right okay. and not to make up for this year's deficit but to account for next year's expenses okay so if you notice for this year we actually wound up spending more than what we brought in uh, because of those increases in staffing. So when we talked about fees last year, we hadn't anticipated that growth. Mm -hmm. And so they were already set. We added some staffing because that's what our students needed. And so now to make up for that going into next year, we did have to accommodate a much larger uh, jump than I would typically want to. Um, and hopefully we don't see as much of an increase for next year as well. But we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. And one of the things that we are looking at too to kind of piggyback on what Katie said is now that every year we have O'Keefe, we get more and more data. And so you can start then using three-year rolling averages, both uh, how many kids do we have? Remarkably, um, and I, I know Member Miller, uh, who served on the previous board, would always make this point, our numbers in District 58 stay extremely consistent, right about that 5100 mark. Where they attend school changes a little bit. And so you can't necessarily use student enrollment um, because that enrollment fluctuates between schools. But looking at that uh, staffing number that we've used over the last several years will help uh, determine 
to try and get that number is close to you know each year as it goes and then of course the expenses for staffing don't necessarily always align with the consumer price index in fact most of the time they're over the consumer price index when you're factoring in raises and you're factoring in uh, health insurance but we will definitely continue to look at those historical trends to try and avoid big swings in fees any other questions i think we're good thank you so much thank Thanks. you thank you All right, this is an opportunity now for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Just please, as a reminder, criticism of any individual is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. At this time, I've received one card. Um, so we will ask that you uh, step up to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. Uh, anyone who did not fill out a card um, before coming to speak, we will give you an opportunity at the end, and we ask that you fill out a card which will be available on the podium. So uh, we have Andrea Petrino from Bel Air. Um, I am a, a parent of a sixth grader at Bel Air, and as you know, um, we've had our class combined um, to 32 students. And we are concerned about what's happening in the classroom, and we feel that the school is not doing enough. We need um, your support, we need the parents' support, we need the school's support, we need to get these kids beyond this. We need to fix it. We need to fix it now because there's no time. We are in December. We're coming to the close of this year. And this has become a toxic environment. And these kids are not learning. They're stressed. They're afraid. They're being bullied. They're bullying. They're trying to stay under the radar so that they don't get bullied. They need help. They need all our support. They need to get past this and continue to learn. And that's our main concern, is that these behaviors stop and whatever resources we need to pull in, because I think we do at this point, we need to do that so that these kids can continue to learn and prepare and get ready for seventh grade, because they can't do that now. Thank you so much. And uh, just to kind of let you know, the board has been, been briefed on, on some of the emails that have come in. and. Uh, and you, I think you've already been following up, but the administration is going to be following up on that, so thank you. I will open up the podium if anyone else has uh, public comment tonight. Okay. All right, great. Then at this time, um, are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 11th, 2019 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 11th, 2019 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 18th, 2019 financial workshop as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 18th financial workshop as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 20th, 2019 Lester PTA meeting and building tour as presented? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Yes. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 20th, 2019 Lester PTA and building tour as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? 
No? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of a list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Oh, wait, no discussion. Uh, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have a couple items uh, up for action tonight. Uh, the first is a three year contract with Securely for student device web content monitoring. Is there a motion to approve a three year contract with Securely as presented? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay. Second. All right, any discussion on that? I'm very happy to see this. <laughs> um, so thank you to uh, James and Dr. Russell for um, going through the pilot process for it, the small pilot, and then rolling it out. So I think that there's been considerable, uh, I've, I've had parents come up to me asking me questions about uh, student data privacy so, and web content. So I'm very happy to see this extra layer of protection provided at home. Fantastic. I do want to note uh, that uh, while we are entering into a three-year contract, you may have seen that we have a six-month window here where if it's not meeting our needs, um, if we're hearing concerns from outside or if they are, we have a, what is it, until June um, to go ahead and then, and then back out of that contract. So, um, but otherwise, it will be a three-year commitment. So. I think one of the, the goals, too, and, I, and again, I want to echo what Tracy said. James, thank you for your, your hard work in this area. We are also hoping that some of the things that we're paying for now to monitor, you know, things kids might like gaggle for instance where kids put things over our servers and we can read if they're you know talking about self-harm or something like that we're hoping that this is more of an all-in-one tool where we may be able to reduce some costs in other areas so it's not as big of an expense to the school district in our technology uh, budget but again when you're talking the safety and security of our students obviously you know expense is not the first thing uh, on our mind but we are going to be taking a look at this over the next six months and um, we will if it's not working the way we want we will come back to you in may or june and talk to you about it at that particular time but we are excited about this uh, again um, i, I want to thank our teachers too it, it, it's crazy as it sounds getting first graders to re-log in after you turn your computers out is a big deal and so we want to thank them for their hard work as they've been working through the pilot great thank you all right Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve a three year contract with Securely as presented. Next up, we have policy 3540 or 4 190, targeted school violence prevention program. Is there a motion to adopt the policy 3540 4 190? Targeted School Violence Prevention Program. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Uh, this is a little different. Normally we have uh, it up for hearing first and then we bring it a second time. This is uh, to comply with, with law. So, all right, then uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt policy 3540-4190, Targeted School Violence Prevention Program. We have a couple announcements today. A parent Teacher Advisory Committee will meet on Monday, December 16th at 4 p.m. at Longfellow. The a Policy Committee meeting will be Tuesday, December 17th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. The Legislative Committee meeting will be Wednesday, December 18th at 3.45 p.m. at the ASC. The Financial Advisory Committee will meet on Friday, January 10th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. And our next regular board meeting will be Monday, January 13th at 7 p.m. at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10? The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees in the district, 5 ILCS 122C1, and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of minutes or the 
the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Right, motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess at 8.45 p.m.